Hello, I'm Eli Arnold, University Librarian and Director of the Philip Waltner Library here at Oglethorpe University. Um, I welcome and thank you for joining us tonight for the seventh and final event in the year-long series of programming to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment granting suffrage to women. The library has coordinated with faculty and staff across campus to bring a full series of lectures, concerts, and more to help students in the entire OU community reflect on this landmark legislation. Uh, tonight, Oglethorpe Lecturer of Core Studies, Dr. Leila Ibrahim Biagovich, will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Eli, and thank you everybody for coming. Um, we're very excited for this talk. Dr. Mariel Meyer uh, received her Physics Bachelor of Arts degree from Smith College in 2006 with a minor in Latin. She then moved to Boulder, Colorado, where she earned her physics PhD in 2012. She joined the Oglethorpe faculty in 2015 and is currently an assistant professor of physics and program coordinator for the physics program. Her research focuses on the interaction of the solar wind, the charged particles and magnetic field coming from the sun with the magnetic field and charged particles around Jupiter and Saturn. Using spacecraft data and computational simulations, she seeks to understand the large scale implications of this interaction. Dr. Meyer lives on the west side of Atlanta with her husband, son, and daughter. When not teaching or studying the solar system, she spends her days camping, cooking, drinking beer, climbing, and playing games. Favorite video games include the Might and Magic series, Skyrim, and Dragon Age. Family favorite board games are King Domino, Azul, Seven Wonders, and Catan. Tonight, Dr. Mariel Meyer will offer a lecture titled Annie Jump Cannon, Destined for the Stars. There will be time after the talk for questions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mariel Meyer. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Really just went with all the details, thanks. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So when Eli asked me about giving this talk, I was really nervous. Um, I'm not a historian. I'm really bad with facts and dates. Like if I can't derive it from first principles, I'm not gonna remember it. My brain does not work well that way. So I've got my notes right next to me, just in case. Um, I'll probably, you'll see my eyes going over there a lot. But over the past few months, I've been learning more about Annie um, Jump Cannon with the help of my sister-in-law, Andrea Meyer. Um, she has a background in museum studies, and so she was able to dig into some of the Harvard Ar archives for me, pull out some material, um, especially about Annie's early life. And what I found was the story of a truly remarkable woman, an astronomer, and I hope to share um, some of what I learned about her with you today, and I hope that you walk away from today a little bit inspired um, and a little bit thoughtful about how we can encourage more girls and women to study physics and astronomy in the future. Uh, let's see, I have to remember, there's a keyboard, but it's not actually for my, no? Okay, there we go. All right. So um, Annie was born uh, in 1863 in Dover, Delaware. There we go. Her father, Wilson Cannon, was a uh, former state senator. Her mother, Mary Jump, who was his second wife, was a Quaker. And that fact actually ends up being really important to Annie's story. Um, this was a time period when women uh, were not really, uh, it wasn't really appropriate for women to be educated highly. Um, there was kind of a hypothesis floating around that too much education would reroute blood from the reproductive system to the brain and women's ovaries would shrivel up and die. However, um, Quakers held the idea that men and women were intellectually and spiritually equal. And as a result, um, Quaker communities operated their own schools that taught women science and mathematics. Um, so this Quaker um, thought was that uh, children's curiosity should be encouraged. And Annie, when she was younger, became very interested in this candelabra in her home. And so this is a quote from her writings. In the house where I was born, there stood on the white marble mantle a candelabra representing a gilded tree. 
At the base, two children are about to waken a sleeping huntsman. Five outspreading branches support the candles, which are surrounded by glass prismatic pendants. I remember no earlier plaything than those prisms, which were easily detachable, to hold one in my hands, to catch a sunbeam and watch the brilliant prismatic colors dance over the wall was a delight to my youthful eyes. Even now I hold one of these pendants in my hands and note that it is embossed with stars. Stars and prisms, how prophetic was this baby amusement of the profession which was destined to fill my life. Um, this candelabra was such a token to Annie that she actually brought it with her wherever she moved. Um, when she later went to Wellesley and Harvard um, and considered it a source of inspiration in her life. Uh, Annie's mother, Mary Jump, who herself had studied astronomy a bit when she was younger, saw Annie's interest in this and enrolled her in classes in physics and astronomy at the local Quaker school. And so she was able to receive an ed education um, you know, through her teenage years. Um, Annie and her, I'm trying to move the pictures around, there we go. Um, Annie and her mother built a little mini observatory in their attic. Um, so this is a picture of her mother on the right, um, Mary Jump, uh, and her father, Wilson Lee Cannon on the left. Um, these are some of the only digitized uh, memorabilia from the archives at Harvard. Everything else is unfortunately not accessible at the moment. Um, so I wanted to include these, but uh, her, her and her mother built a mini observatory where they would just sit and, and look at the stars and trace their motion using her mother's outdated astronomy textbooks. Um, her father was not really impressed by this, He's not really interested in her education or her interest in astronomy. Um, he seemed to be more concerned that they were going to burn the house down with the candles that they were using at night. Um, so all of her support as a young child to study the sciences really came from her mother. <clears throat> um, Annie graduated from high school at the age of 16 um, from, it was a Wilmington Preparatory School, don't quote me on that name, um, but it's interesting only because that school later becomes we Wesley College um, and Sometimes there's confusion uh, in the history books about her past because they confuse Wesley and Wellesley, which is where she ended up. Um, but she went to this preparatory school until she was 16 and her teachers there were so, um, were so insistent that she pursue further education that they convinced her parents to find her a college to attend. And so they toured the East Coast and they settled on Wellesley College uh, which she enrolled in in 1880. Wellesley had only opened its doors to students five years before, so Wellesley was a very new um, college. Wellesley is an all-women's college. To this day, it's an all-women's college. It was surrounded, it was surrounded, it was founded by the Durants, um, who thought of it as a kind of educational experiment at the time, there weren't very many opportunities for women in higher education. And so they thought that they would use their wealth to provide female students and faculty the same opportunities that were available to men at nearby MIT and Harvard. So finding faculty at Wellesley was a bit of a challenge. Um, first of all, because there weren't many women who had been educated, who had received graduate education. So much of the faculty at Wellesley didn't have formal training in their disciplines. In addition, um, the, the faculty were almost all single and had kind of accepted spinsterhood as their, as their life. Um, if a faculty member or even the president of the college got married, they were expected to step down because it was assumed that you couldn't have a uh, marital life and, and take care of the obligations of married life and also work on the faculty in academia. So as I was saying, um, Annie entered Wellesley in 1880. Um, while she was there, she majored in, I don't know how to get the pictures. There we go. Uh, there, that's better. Okay. She majored in physics and chemistry um, because there was no astronomy department at Wellesley. Um, there were, in fact, very few astronomy departments anywhere during this time period. Um, 
when we think of his astronomy now, we think of it as a science. And more than that, we kind of tend to think of it, I think, as an ancient science. It's one that's been a long for, around for a very long time. But astronomy, until we had photographic tools, photography, um, to take images, it was really just something that you could do with your eyes, right? Even when you had a telescope, you can make observations, but there was no way to record anything. So there was no real way to take data. So astronomy wasn't really thought of as a science in the way that physics, chemistry, or anatomy were. Um, because of this, um, there weren't many men who were interested in astronomy which actually benefited women, right? There was a way to get into this field because men hadn't kind of claimed it as their own. And so it was a bit easier for female researchers to um, enter astronomy and publish in that field. In addition, um, astronomy was not at this time a field where there was a lot of financial support because it wasn't thought of as a real science. Um, but it was just thought of as like rote star mapping and, and stuff. But, you know, women were used to not being paid anything. <laughs> no matter what science they went into, they weren't going to get paid. So they went into astronomy in larger numbers than some of the other sciences um, because they could at least get the credit for the work, some credit for the work they were doing. We'll talk about that more later. So, and I know that was a little bit of an aside, but Annie entered Wellesley originally to study physics and chemistry. Um, and while she was there, she met Sarah Whitting. I think it's Whitting. It might be Whiting. I don't really know. We'll say Sarah Whitting because it sounds better. So Sarah Whitting was the physics faculty at Wellesley at the time. The Durants had hired her because she had a reputation for her laboratory work in physics despite the fact that she had no graduate training in physics. Um, she was one of the only female physicists in America at this time. Um, she, her specialties were spectroscopy, which we'll talk about more later because that's relevant to Annie's work, and um, x-ray photography. She took x-ray images. So the Durants hired Sarah to work at Wellesley and for the first couple of years that she was there, um, she was allowed to go to the other universities in the area and take classes and see their labs and um, sit in lectures and get access to spaces that were traditionally men only, and women were not allowed into. So she visited Harvard extensively and talked to a man named Edward Pickering, who will come up in a little bit, and she spent a lot of time at MIT. At MIT, she saw their undergraduate physics lab. Now, to us now, it seems like a no-brainer that, of course, a school that's teaching sciences is going to have a physics lab. But MIT's undergraduate physics lab was actually the first in the country. Um, traditionally, the sciences were taught somewhat like mathematics. It was, you know, textbooks and writing and not hands-on action. And Sarah saw the lab at MIT, and she went back to Wellesley, and she was you know, went to the Durants and got the funding to build an experimental undergraduate physics lab at Wellesley. It was only the second in the country, and obviously the first that was for women only. Um, so she really brought this new kind of teaching science to Wellesley. Um, it actually permeated to some of the other disciplines um, it, uh, in anatomy and uh, chemistry as well. They started being much more hands-on than many other schools and the way they were teaching. So um, uh, Annie came to Wellesley. She met Sarah. Sarah became a mentor to her um, and a friend and um, was probably an influence in Annie's life in terms of encouraging her to think about the independence that women can have. Right? I mean, this is me hypothesizing, but she was a spinster um, who was pursuing the thing that she was passionate about, pursuing physics, despite the fact that there were so many barriers in her way. And I would imagine that Annie also saw that as, um, saw that as an as inspiration. Um, Annie seems to, from uh, her writings and her diaries, have been very happy while she was at Wellesley. 
Um, and in reflections, um, she speaks very fondly of the time that she spent there. Her um, mentee later in life, Cecilia Payne, uh, writes, you know, speaking about Annie, recalling her time at Wellesley, um, one might have expected the girls to be very serious and earnest, but they always seem to be laughing. And Cecilia goes on to say that that's the spirit um, that Annie went through life with, that she always um, approached what other people saw as laborious and exacting with joy and vitality. So she was, uh, Annie seems from a very, you know, young age through college to really have found something she was passionate about and found joy in it. So Annie graduated from Wellesley um, as valedictorian, which with a bachelor's degree in physics in 1884. Uh, and then she went back home for nine years. And during those nine years that when she was at home, she did not do very much. So to all of you um, undergrads who are seeing your, you know, you're coming to the end of your four years at Oglethorpe, um, or maybe you've got just a little bit more time, she took a break for nine years. She went home, she tutored a little math and science. Um, she learned a little bit about photography, but she didn't really do very much. And during this time in her diary, she wrote, I am sometimes so very dissatisfied here. I do want to accomplish something so badly. There are so many, many things that I could do if only I had the money. Who hasn't said that? And when I think that I might be teaching and making the money and still all the time improving myself, it makes me feel unhappy and as if I were not doing all I can. So in 1892, um, so after being home about eight years, Annie traveled to Europe. This was something of a vacation, but she had actually been commissioned by a camera company. She had been learning photography to go and take photos of her trip. And so she traveled to Spain and she was supposed to be taking pictures of the solar eclipse in Spain. Um, she ended up taking a bunch of photos of Spain generally and she put together a pamphlet about um, her trip that was then uh, exhibited at the Chicago World's Exposition by the camera company showing off the photos that she had taken. So she had that little aside. And then when she came home, and some terrible things happened. Um, first, she contracted scarlet fever. She had been sick in childhood and had had some hearing loss. But in 1893, when she returned home, she became very ill and eventually recovered from scarlet fever. But when she recovered, she was completely deaf. Um, she did learn to lip read somewhat and much later in life, she did have a hearing aid that helped somewhat um, and reports as to her dis disposition um, later in life after she lost her hearing are really mixed. Um, some people, some recordings say that she was pretty antisocial, but if you read her writings and I'll, I'll read some to you later, it, I don't, I think that she was still like excited to be doing the things that she loved later in life and that she was still able to find joy and find joy in her community. Um, about uh, just a few months after she lost her hearing, her mother died. And three months after her mother died, she was still at home and she wrote, I'm still here in my little room, surrounded by my memories. My mother is ever before me. I can see how people lose their minds, for I believe I shall if I am not aroused by something. Um, she was obviously distraught. She wasn't happy, and she decided to do something about it. She threw herself back into her work. She sent a message. She wrote to Sarah Whitting. Um, and asked if Sarah knew of any job opportunities. <clears throat> Sarah um, responded enthusiastically and had Annie return to Wellesley, enrolled her in Wellesley's master's program and hired her to teach introductory physics and astronomy. So this picture on the left is Annie having returned shortly after having returned to Wellesley. Um, this telescope that she's looking through is a four inch scope 
Um, it was transportable, so they would move it around to different parts of the campus. Um, and that was one of the main telescopes they used until um, Sarah had, Whitting had the observatory built in 1900, at which point they retired the four inch scope. Um, and so the right is just a, a picture of the observatory that bears sort of Sarah's name. So Annie returned um, to Wellesley and began teaching there. Um, shortly after returning to Wellesley, she also enrolled at Radcliffe. Um, Radcliffe was a women's college as well, and it was a women's college that was connected to Harvard. It doesn't seem that Annie really took any classes at Radcliffe. Rather, she used that as a way to get access to Harvard's telescopes. Um, the, you know, Harvard didn't accept women until the 1960s, and so this was really the only way for her to get access to the, the scopes in the observatory there. Um, I, I will talk about what's on this slide more in a moment, but I just want to speak a little bit more. So Annie returned to Wellesley. Um, pretty soon after returning to Wellesley, she'll begin to work for Edward Pickering, who we'll talk more about in a moment, at Harvard. Um, but we can see the joy um, return to her pretty quickly upon coming back to uh, Wellesley. In 1896, she wrote, Soon it will be 97 and three years have passed, two busy years at Wellesley and then this one at the Harvard Observatory. The busy life I so long for has been opened up to me. Friends have come to me from the great world in my heart. My life for now the study of astronomy. They little know what it means to me, how it was the only thread holding my reason almost my life. I no longer look forward with dread. The days have no terror. I long for my mother just the same, but I feel that I have the patience to run my race, to do the work set before me, and I'm able to find contentment in my surroundings. I could not help it, thrown as I am with such kind people. Reading what she writes, um, you know, you can just feel the roller coaster of emotion that she has gone through. Um, and to be back in a space where she feels um, so much happiness and joy, it, it's apparent from her writing that she, she, she has found her tribe, right? She has found her people. Um, she has found her space. So to get more into the, those people and that space, um, I'd like to introduce Edward Pickering. So Edward Pickering uh, was the head of the Harvard Observatory at this time. Uh, he was also the uh, founder of the American Astronomical Society. And uh, Pickering had a bit of a problem because Henry Draper, who had been this wealthy amateur astronomer, had passed away suddenly. And Draper's goal before passing away had been to catalog the spectra of all the stars in the sky, which is a lot. And his widow had set up a foundation to continue this work and had left Pickering with a great deal of money and equipment. Now, keep in mind, this is still a time when astronomy is just getting its footing. It's just establishing itself as a field. Um, so as the Harvard Observatory, well, it did exist, um, was not a very like wealthy part of the institution. Supposedly Pickering used to collect the grass clippings from the yard in front of the green in front of the observatory and sell them um, for animal feed in order to pay the mathematicians that he employed at the observatory. So obviously he's going to accept Draper's money um, and equipment, but then he needed to figure out how to make the most of it. Um, even though it was a decent amount of money, it wasn't really enough money to hire skilled male uh, astronomers to work full-time on the spectra. He tried um, to hire undergraduates, um, but by the time he got them trained up to the point where they were useful, they were graduating or they had found another job. And so he started to look at the female astronomers in the area. You have not only Wellesley, but also Radcliffe nearby to draw from. Um, he 
didn't necessarily um, want to be paying women less. I think that a lot of times when you read about the Harvard computers, um, he gets kind of this bad reputation because he, it sounds like he was exploiting them. We can talk about whether or not he was exploiting them. I mean, he was working within the system that he had to work within. Um, but when later in life he was able to pay his female and male researchers equally, he did. It's just that Harvard didn't allow him to promote the women to the status that they deserved to be promoted to. And so he took advantage in order, in, in order to have cheap labor that he needed to do the job. So um, Pickering really kind of undervalued the work that the women were doing and, and fed into that institution and overvalued the work that the men that were working at the observatory were doing. Um, the men were in charge of manning the telescopes and then the women were in charge of actually analyzing the spectra that were produced. Um, and over this time period, he hired a total of about 80 women um, to work on this Draper catalog, cataloging the spectra of the stars. <clears throat> For the women, there were advantages as well um, because they got access to the telescopes. And so, you know, they could publish their own papers, they could do their own research. And there are several women in this group um, who made large contributions to astronomy. Um, Wilhelmina Fleming discovered the existence of white dwarf stars. Antonio, Antonia Mari um, discovered spectroscopic binary stars, like two stars that are tied, you know, connected together. Um, Henrietta Leavitt, uh, she studied um, variable stars and established standard candles. So a lot of great work came out of this group of women. They were able to publish their work. However, they couldn't publish as first authors. And so Pickering's name got put on all of their papers. And so this kind of feeds back into, okay, so Harvard is getting recognition for their work that they've done um, through his name being on the papers. And so it, it, you know, who comes out on top in the end, I'm not, really sure, but it was, uh, there was a lot of back and forth in this relationship between Pickering and the women that worked for him. Um, <clears throat> these women, this group of women were unofficially called Pickering's harem um, by some of the professors at Harvard who were disgusted and shocked that so many women were on campus. Um, as I've mentioned, the name uh, more heritable uh, name would be the Harvard computers. And those of you that have seen hidden figures probably recognize that language. Um, the women in that movie were called computers as well. So, um, sorry, oh. So Pickering um, hired Annie to join this team of women that were working on the Draper catalog. Um, he, had, he knew Sarah Whitting and so it was a natural connection that was made there. Um, so here is a, a picture of some of the Harvard computers working. Uh, Annie is right here in the center. I realize I haven't like shown you a good picture of her. We'll see one before the end. But um, the Harvard Observatory working on this Draper catalog and just in general was a really gendered space. So the men would work at night and they would just operate the telescopes and they would take um, photographs and then they would leave the photographs for the women and so the women would work analyzing the photographs all day. So it's kind of like an assembly line for cataloging the stars, um, except the reality is that the women were the ones that were getting hands-on, right? They were actually looking at the data. They were actually trying to make sense of it. They were trying to organize it. Um, so the nowadays we would think of the women is doing the science. I mean, they were the ones that were problem solving and thinking through what was um, what was happening. So <clears throat> Annie, um, sorry, I've got something in my throat. Annie started working with Pickering in 1896. Um, she could categorize stars by their spectra incredibly quickly. Um, she could categorize about three stars a minute by the time that she uh, retired, 
she had classified um, about 350,000 stars. And we'll look at what that means in a moment. Um, in addition, she kind of had a separate project going with Pickering where they were collecting data from um, amateur astronomers from all over the world to study variable stars, stars whose brightness dims and brightens and changes. And so um, she put together a catalog of variable stars as well. And so she earned this nickname of the census taker of the sky as a result, just because of her ability to process um, all of this data. So I'm going to take a little break from the history um, to talk about this science. Yay! Um, so, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. This is what Annie is known for. Uh, this phrase right here, and if you don't like it the way it's written, oh, be a fine guy, kiss me. Oh, be a fine gender neutral person and kiss me. Um, there's something that I saw, oh, oh boy, an F grade, kill me. I don't know, there's so many options, but this is what she's known for. So Annie was looking at the light that comes from the stars. Stars create light. Y'all know that. We have a sun. It creates light, right? So stars produce um, a spectrum, a, a whole bunch of light. Think of it as a rainbow. And this graph over here, and we don't need to know the details, but this graph is telling us about the spectrum of light that stars produce because of their temperature, because of the fact that they're hot bodies. So this blue curve in this graph is for a very hot star. And the temperature is, it says 15,000 Kelvin, okay? The x-axis in this graph is like color, okay? You can see the little band that represents the colors that we can actually see. And then there are other colors of light, right? There's like ultraviolet or infrared. The y-axis represents intensity or brightness or just how much of that color the star produces. So we can see the very hot star, the yellow line represents our star. And you can see that the spectrum for our star is peaked in that visible part. It's not by chance, like the sun didn't evolve to meet our eyes, our eyes evolved to meet the sun. Um, but you can see also like the sun, which is not as hot as this 15,000 Kelvin star, none of the colors are really as bright. And then we have an even a uh, lower temperature star, and it peaks in a different spot, and it's really not as bright either. And then here's poor little humans over here. We create light too, but we don't create visible light. We just create infrared light. And that's what this image is showing. So all of the stars that Annie's looking at create a spectrum of light. They create a rainbow of light. So here's kind of a schematic of different stars and what they might look like in terms of their colors. We have big blue hot guys over here down to little red small guys over there. And you can see the letters underneath, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. O, B, A, fine, girl, guy, gender neutral person, kiss me. So you might think, okay, so Annie was looking at the light from the stars. She said, okay, this light's bluer and this light's redder. So that star is an M and this star is a blue, but that's not actually what she was doing because the color, the pictures that she was looking at were black and white. And it's challenging to get color out of black and white. Not impossible, but challenging. Um, it turns out that stars don't just produce a spectrum. They actually produce a spectrum that has some lines taken out of it. And the reason for that is that the sun is a hot body and it produces that rainbow. But the sun is surrounded by a cloud of gas. And that cloud of gas is made out of chemicals, ions, atoms, molecules, whatever else, chemicals that absorb some of the light from the hot body as it passes through the cloud. And what is produced when we take that light after it's passed through the cloud and we pass it through a prism, we wanna spread out that light to see all the colors, just like when you get a rainbow, you see that some of the colors have been taken out. 
These color, these colors that have been taken out, these lines are what we call absorption lines. Each element, and even within that, each ion uh, just talks about how many electrons have been taken off of the element, off the atom. But each element, we'll just say that, each element has its different set of absorption lines. The absorption lines we can think of as fingerprints for the chemicals that are in the gas. So if you can look at the lines that are present in a spectrum, you can figure out what are the chemicals in the gas that surround the sun or whatever it is that you're looking at. This is a spectrum from the sun, our sun. Uh, this, this is like the rainbow, right, where we had all the colors side by side. Um, but this, that, and we wouldn't be able to see all these details if we put all this side by side. So it's kind of stacked on top of each other. So all of these little black lines in here are absorption lines. And by analyzing the spectrum and analyzing where all of these lines are, and more than that, analyzing like how bright or dim they are, we can figure out what chemicals are between the sun and us observing the sun. This is more in line with what Annie was doing. And so if we look at the spectra from different kinds of stars and we look at the lines in that spectra, we can see, oh, be a fine girl guy, gender neutral person and kiss me. And we see all of the different lines and how each of these has a unique set of lines, but there are similarities. For example, this line over here on the right, right, from A to K has that dark line, but how, uh, how dark it is changes depending on the kind of star we have. And then there's a star over here, or sorry, a line over here that does the same thing. Now, it turns out that when we look at these rankings that these classifications that Annie came up with, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, if those numbers or those letters don't make sense to you, I'll talk about them more in a moment. When we look at how she organized the stars, um, it follows the temperatures of these stars. O, the big blue one, is the hottest star. M, the little red one, is the coolest star. But Annie didn't know anything about the temperatures of these stars. She was only basing her classification for the stars, how she organized them, based off of what she saw in their spectra for the lines that were represented. This is the kind of image that Annie was actually looking at. So this is um, a field of spectra. <coughs> And it actually has some of her notes on here. There's a class A star up here um, near the top. I'm worried that the zoom thing is on top of it, but there's a class M star. There's a little nebula down here. I cannot for the life of me make out what her note is in the center of this slide. So let's talk about exactly what Annie was doing. Um, before photographic technology had developed, the way that astronomers would look at a star's spectrum is really one star at a time, like pass the light from a star through a prism, look at the rainbow, look at the vertical lines. Once we had uh, photography, we could pass the light from a whole bunch of stars through a prism and onto uh, and, and create basically a, a photographic image. But now, of course, like this is all in black and white. And so <clears throat> Annie would look at these um, plates and she would put it on a pedestal that had a mirror underneath and the mirror would reflect the sun's light. And so this whole thing would be backlit. And then she would take a microscope and she would look at each of those little streaks. Each of those little streaks is a star. And if you put your face up real close, you can see the little lines in it. And so she would look at the little lines and look at the pattern and classify the star as one of the types that I showed on the previous slide. Um, she could do this incredibly quickly and she would just kind of shout out her classifications to an assistant who would write them down. So this is the work that she was doing. 
she was classifying the stars, but she wasn't just doing grunt work, she helped to come up with that classification. Um, this is an actual page from the final Draper catalog that was published. Um, so you can have a series of spectra over here and they're labeled with different, um, the different letters. And then this one on the right, it's just a blow up of the top three. Um, although for the life of me, I can't quite figure out where in the image it's coming from, but it's labeled as being the top three on the, from the left. So um, before Annie kind of got really into this project, um, the primary system of classifying stars at Harvard had been developed by Wilhelmina Fleming. Um, it consisted of 22 classes based on when the stars were discovered. And it was really focused on the lines in the spectrum that came from hydrogen. And so when I say it was based on when they were discovered, I literally mean like the first kind of star they found, they were like, that's A. And then the next one, that's B. And then, oh, this one's the same as the first one, that's an A2. Oh, this is a new kind of spectra, that's C. And so those A, B, C classifications, um, Annie reused those in her OBA fine person, except it doesn't work, guy, whatever, and kiss me. Um, she reused those, but she reordered them so that it actually made sense. And she got rid of a bunch of them. She collapsed some down. Um, Antonio Mori had actually developed a different system for classifying the stars, but Pickering really didn't like her system. She was like the only one using it in, in the observatory. And her system was based off of the lines from helium. Um, her reasoning had like a little bit more science behind it, but again, like Pickering didn't like it, so it didn't get a lot of weight. So Annie like looked at these systems that were being used um, after she had classified several thousands of stars um, and, and she brought the systems together. So she used the lettering system, she used the lines of hydrogen, but she also recognized that the lines of helium like had there's like important, there was something important in the classifications of stars based on helium as well. So <clears throat> um, she, re she created this new um, classification that was a much smaller and tighter and allowed astronomers to start to see clear patterns in the stars that they could not see before. Um, it wasn't really until much later, almost 20 years later, that there was any theoretical basis for this. It wasn't really until 1925 that it was understood that her ranking that she had come up with just based on the lines and how thick they were um, and how dark they were rather uh, was related to temperature and that it, it like, you know, correctly predicted the stars temperatures. Okay, um, that was maybe more of a science aside than we needed. Um, <laughs> I will say though that Annie's system is still in use, although with some modification. So we still use the same um, OB a fine girl and kiss me. Um, but within that, we have subclasses now based on the star's brightness um, and luminosity. And that actually is related more to the work that was done by Maury with the helium lines. But it's still the basis of the sort of stellar classification that we use today. Okay. So back to um, Annie's life a little bit. I'm realizing I'm like really not doing a great job with time management. Um, so the Harvard computers completed the Draper catalog after 46 years of work. Um, they published it in 1918. So here they are. Um, and about a year later, Pickering uh, got ill and uh, died from pneumonia. Um, pretty soon after this, Annie started getting a lot more recognition for her work. And, you know, who knows why that is? Like, maybe that's just because the Draper catalog was published and she was associated with it. And so she was starting to get the recognition for all the work she had done on it. Or maybe it's because with Pickering passing, like she was no longer in his shadow as much, um, but she started getting a lot more credit for the work that she had done. Um, she finished, she had already finished her master's degree um, 
12 years earlier in 1907, and she was awarded an honorary, honorary doctorate from the University of Delaware in 1918. And then for the next six years after Pickering died, Annie just got all the accolades. She got all sorts of praise. She was the first woman um, to get an honorary doctorate from Oxford. She um, became an honorary member of the Royal Astronomical Society. And she was nominated to the National Academy of Sciences. However, um, she was not elected to the National Academy of Sciences because they, um, some of the members declared that they could not vote for her on the grounds that she was deaf and therefore, in their words, defective. <clears throat> um, somehow during this like six-year time period, she also found time to travel to Peru, Peru and worked in an observatory there for a while, taking photos of the um, southern sky, which I just think is, is lovely um, as a little aside that she managed to travel the world so much in this time. So here is kind of the picture of Annie that we always see when you search for Annie Jump Cannon, um, this profile picture. Uh, and we have Cecilia Payne Kaposchkin, who did something of an unofficial postdoc under Annie. So Annie returned in the 1920s to Harvard to work at the observatory. Cecilia came um, in 1925 to work with her and use some of her um, data and spectra. Um, Cecilia would later become the first female professor at Harvard and the first female astronomy department head there. Um, Cecilia, for those that don't know, is the person who um, demonstrated, who proved really that the sun and other stars are made up primarily of hydrogen and helium. So she told us what stars are made of. Also deserves her own uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> so after 1925, uh, things kind of started to slow down for Annie. She was working at Harvard. Um, she <coughs> was always recognized as um, an academic and an accomplished scientist. She was also during this time a speaker for women's rights. Um, and uh, I tried to find any sort of transcripts, but unfortunately everything is in the archives um, just on paper and isn't been digitized. I really wanted to be able to read her words on um, from some of the speeches that she gave. She became a member of the National Women's Party um, and in 1929, she was um, chosen by the League of Women Voters as one of America's greatest living women. Um, and then in 1931, she was awarded the Henry Draper Medal from the National Academy of Sciences, which all sorts of things wrong with that statement, but there it is. Um, in 1932, Annie was awarded the Ellen Richards Research Prize um, by the Association to Aid Scientific Research by Women. And then, like um, almost immediately, the association dissolved, claiming that since women are given opportunities in research equally as men, the objectives of the association have been achieved. Um, Annie apparently wrote a passive, very passive aggressive letter to um, the association. Um, thanking them for the money and questioning their dissolution. Um, and then she turned around and took the money that they had given her as, as well as a lot of other prize money that she had earned um, and started her own award, which she named after herself. Um, and the Annie Jump Cannon has been awarded by the American Astronomical Society ever since. Um, the first uh, awardee was Cecilia Payne Kaposchkin. And very sweetly, um, Annie had a special pin made for her um, with the award. And since then, it's been tradition that the recipient receive a piece of custom jewelry related to their research when they receive the award. So um, Annie never had any romantic relationship. She never had children. That wasn't her, her fate. Um, she is quoted as saying when she was older, I deserve no particular credit. I have concentrated on my work, that is all. 
I find it so fascinating and absorbing that nothing else exists. The trouble with most women is they do not stick to their word. They marry and drop it. Mind, I believe marriage is a fine thing if a woman marries the right man, but it should not stop a woman's work any more than it does a man. Century, century too early with that sentiment. Um, so Annie was appointed um, finally in 1938 to the Harvard faculty. Um, she was uh, named the curator of astronomical photographs and um, she retired just two years later from Harvard in 1940, but she continued to work pretty much up until when she passed away in 1941 from heart failure. Her work was her life. It was what she was passionate about. It was what she cared about. Um, Cecilia Payne spoke a lot about, um, wrote a really glowing obituary. It was really interesting. Annie wrote a, an obituary for Sarah and Cecilia wrote one for Annie. And she just spoke about how Annie was the heart of the Harvard Observatory, how she spoke about how she used to bake cookies and she, she was the, the life of that space. So that is Annie Jump Cannon. I know we're at the end of time. I'm gonna push it. I know I also said I had to put the kids to bed, but I just wanna push it a tiny bit um, to talk very briefly about women in astronomy today. My core students know where this is going already. Um, so in 1900, 10% of the American Astronomical Society membership was women. In 1940, 17% was. I couldn't find the number for more recently. I don't know what that's about. Um, but I would guess based on other numbers that it's not higher than 30%. We're not at equality in astronomy, despite it being a field that women are more heavily represented in than other parts of the physical sciences. So just to give us some stats real quick. Um, so for bachelor's degrees awarded to women in astronomy, it's the little purple line right here, around 30 to 40% go to women, which is actually much better than physics, which is down here at 20%. Uh, when we look at PhDs, it's really about the same. Um, actually, women in astronomy don't earn PhDs at quite the same level that they earn bachelor's degrees. I'm not quite sure. Well, maybe they do because there is a time lag here. But, um, you know, these are not, we are not at gender equality yet. We, we don't quite have equal representation in astronomy. Um, most notably, I think, is the fact that less than 2% of physics um, Nobel Prizes have been awarded to women. It's four out of 216. Um, <clears throat> so that's where we're at. And you have to wonder why, right? When there are women who have such passion about astronomy as Annie had, where are those women today? Why aren't we, aren't we seeing um, women being represented as men are in these fields? And you might think that maybe it's just, Annie is a, a rare species, right? There's not that many women that are into astronomy and, and it's just not a women's field. It's a societal thing. <laughs> I don't know what it is and I know we don't have time to talk about it. This is physics degrees, not astronomy. If those numbers track, it's fine. Um, but when we look at physical sciences in other countries, um, the the representation by women changes, the representation of women changes in, in other countries. And, and I do think that there is something in our society that creates this gendered atmosphere. Um, there are so many efforts to make things better. There are children's books that are focused on women and astronomy and space and physics. Um, there are websites like NASA, you know, women at NASA that you can go and read about all of the uh, women working at NASA. Um, I wanted to touch on because to me, Annie's story is a story of mentors and women supporting each other from her mother to Sarah um, and then her to Cecilia. Um, I wanted to share just a smidge. Um, this was my research group in grad school. Um, this was, we were going through a, a, we just lost a lot. We just graduated a bunch of people. So this is right before I graduated. Um, and my mentor, Fran Bagnell, is in the center here. <clears throat> And I thought, hey, like, let's take a look at Fran's research group more recently. And there weren't super recent pictures. This is a couple of years later. 
This is her research group. There's Fran. Julia is back here. You can't really see her. Um, and Fran, the thing is that Fran is a woman who supports women in science. I mean, she speaks about it. She writes about it. She is passionate about this. And, and this is still where her space physics research group is right now um, in terms of representation. So lots of work to be done, um, but I think that we can um, honor Annie Jump Cannon and, and make efforts in our own lives to honor what she was about, which to me more than anything was about finding the thing you're excited about and just finding joy in that and, and studying that and pursuing that, right? It doesn't matter. Like if, if somebody is not interested in astronomy or not interested in physics, they shouldn't be going into those fields. If they are, let's make sure that we are encouraging them. Let's make sure that we're like really supporting them and be a role model. Don't be a role model and, you know, be in the sciences if you're not in the sciences, but be a role model and pursue the things that you are passionate about and that give you joy. And I think that if we can really try to promote that in our lives, then maybe like little by little pieces will fall into place and we'll have more women like Annie Jump Cannon entering astronomy and physics. Okay, that's it guys. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Meyer, uh, for telling us about uh, Annie Jump Cannon. You did fail to mention the highest point of her life, her 1935 honorary degree from Oglethorpe University. I did. Woman, so you did fail to mention that that ultimate ultimate prize that she that she won. But uh, but yeah, so we have uh, still a minute or two, maybe for a question or two. So we have just a couple minutes, like two minutes for questions. Who would like to ask um, a question of Dr. Meyer? Just unmute yourself. Uh, thanks, Dr. Meyer. Before I ask uh, my question, I just want to thank Eli Arnold for putting together this series for the year. It's been excellent programming. Um, I've enjoyed every talk, so thank you so much. Um, and Dr. Meyer, you have to thank your sister-in-law for all the archival work. I love the photos. They were amazing. Um, my question is about, kind of goes to education. I'm curious as to how much in undergrad and graduate school you learn about the history of underrepresented scientists, women, people of color, non-Western scientists, and how you, what you learned or didn't learn kind of shapes how you approach teaching your students today. Um, yeah, I know for me, I would say that I learned literally nothing about underrepresented scientists um, in undergrad or grad school, especially not grad school, at least in undergrad, there might've been conversations because I, I was at Smith College, which is a women's college. Um, and so just being in that environment, we had some different conversations about at least gender representation in sciences, but it's not part of the science curriculum. And, um, you know, talking about non-Western scientists is not part of the traditional science curriculum. Um, I will say for me at Oglethorpe, I have continued to struggle with how to bring that into my physics classes because there's so much physics content that we cover. And so I try to put a lot of that into my core course. And so the core course is the opportunity um, to show all students um, you know, other representations that you don't usually see and to have these discussions about representation in science. Um, I think that that doesn't necessarily like help in terms of keeping people in the sciences that may not feel like they're welcome or have a place, um, but it at least like starts a conversation and raises awareness. I have a quick question about auras. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> about auras or auroras? No, it's the one that you don't want to talk about. Because, okay. <laughs> like, are we emitting light? I mean, 
We are emitting light. Yes. Well, that's pretty cool. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave it at that. That's I'm gonna research that because um yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so does so does a rock. So so does a rock. A rock has an aura. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well said. <laughs> Um, yes, and to Stacia's comment in the chat, um, I think that uh, we have talked many times, um, different faculty in the sciences and in the humanities about having some sort of course, a core course, something on women in the sciences um, and mathematics. I think that that is always something that we want to be able to offer and at some point when we are less overloaded and, and have better faculty representation, I think we'd love to offer that. Alex? Sorry, talk it forward. <laughs> Hold on, sorry. Okay, I wasn't sure I had to like click the right button. Um, so I, I guess my, my question is um, in, in a lot of the introductory science courses and even the core courses, um, it's, it's hard to foster a, a relationship with students who are not already inherently, you know, interested in uh, sciences and uh, not inherently sort of not intrinsically motivated to pursue science. So where along the way, like academically, do you think that sort of is, where do you think some of those key milestones are for fostering that sort of interest in, in, in young women or, or, you know, anyone else for that matter? Yeah, I mean, I think that it really needs to start early and, and that by the time that we get to undergrad, not that it's too late to foster any sort of appreciation for the sciences, but certainly to get somebody really invested and want it to be part of their lives um, that needs to happen before undergrad and really even before high school. Um, you know, when we look at you know, six-year-olds and how they gender certain activities and math and science skills are part of that. Um, so I think that the earlier we can start, the better. Um, but then, you know, even if it's something that happens later in life, I mean, I don't know if this is true or not, or they're just trying to like make me feel good in my core class, but my core students do seem to seem to indicate that they are finding, an, some of them are finding an appreciation for science that they didn't have before in our conversations. And, and so maybe that won't, you know, it's not gonna put them in a career in science, but it might make them more aware of the science that's happening in the world around them and might make it so that when they have children or nieces and nephews or their friends' kids, they can encourage them, they can support them, they can say, hey, have you heard about so-and-so? Or did you see this in the news? Or why don't we go to that science museum together? And those small things can trickle, I mean, it's a trickle down thing, but I think that they can make a difference. Yeah, thank you. It seems like a combination of those, like uh, uh, fostering the intrinsic interest and also issuing the whole stigma against you know science being, boring and stuffy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have a question? Sort of. This is a topic that I've been thinking about because there's, hi, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a, I, there's a, there's currently a, like a diversity fellowship. So I've been thinking a little bit literally about this topic. So some of the bloods that you showed, I saw <laughs> like yesterday. Um, and so, when I think about it, I always like, I think you mentioned that by the time you get to grad school, there's just, there's not enough. Uh, you saw the picture of, with Fran, it's like, they, they don't have any women, but they probably are, there aren't any women applying <laughs> to begin with. And the ones that are applying get accepted by a bunch of schools, right? And so starting, you have to start early. But I always think of like, starting early is a long haul process. That's like long term. And so, when I think about it this way, it's how much do we have to do as people who are interested in science to support like middle school teachers, high school teachers? I, I always struggle with that because most people, I don't know if you have any thoughts of that or like where do we, how much is too much and how little is too little and how much should we do versus how much is the high school teacher's responsibility? I don't want to put it that way because I know that there's an entire problem there, but 
I don't know if you you have an opinion on this. On like how how can we be more more supportive, but given the boundaries of time <laughs> constraints and like budget and everything else. I don't know. Uh, at least in your opinion, what's like something that seems to work. Yeah, I don't think there's any easy answer. I do a lot of work with the American Association of Physics Teachers, which brings together university um, physics faculty, but also high school and even um, middle school, sometimes elementary school teachers come as well. And so, um, you know, that's one way to start these inter interactions and start these conversations and help support those teachers. But it is, it's a time thing. I mean, we all have our own jobs and we have our own students and they have their you know classes and are usually overworked as well but i think that thinking about you know one way to address it head on is thinking about how we train those teachers right so um how what can we do in the undergrad or grad school curriculum for teachers to foster science literacy and to foster science enthusiasm um, that is, I think, a spot where we can like actually make a difference. Um, maybe not us personally, because Oglethorpe doesn't have an education school, but um, but more generally, like at the uh, you know college and university level, that's a place that we can have an impact. Um, I do have to go because the littles need to go to bed. <laughs> yes, this is this is perfect. This um, the I want to thank you again, Dr. Meyer. Um, and this year of celebration has not gone as we had planned two years ago when we decided to do this, but I want to thank all of our speakers, uh, Dr. Sarah Terry, Dr. Janelle Pham, Dr. Raina Giddens, Dr. Jay Lutz, Professor Jessica Handler, Dr. Leila ibram Bogovic, Dr. Mara Meyer, and also Dr. Glenn Scharfman, former provost, and all of the OU faculty and staff that helped make this you know, year of possible. And please be on the lookout for our next year of celebration, which will be in 2022. We're still trying to decide what we're going to celebrate. So uh, be on the lookout. And we really appreciate uh, everybody attending tonight and hope you have a good evening.